The summer of 2000 was a good time to be a Cardinals fan. The team had just won the division. Mark McGuire was getting older, but still swatting dingers like nobody's business, and they had a pitching prospect that a lot of people believed was going to be the best in the game someday. Rick and Keel hadn't even made 40 starts in the big leagues yet, but by the time the 2000 playoffs started, he was being compared to left-handed greats like Steve Carlton and Sandy Koufax. And Keel had everything. An electric fastball that could hit 98, a devastating curveball, and the competitive swagger of an ace to top it all off. And Keel finished second in the Rookie of the Year voting that season, and was so impressive, and so not injured, that he was picked to start Game 1 of the Cardinals Division Series against the Braves. And it started pretty well. But when Ankiel came back out to pitch the top of the third, something happened. Ankiel, who was a little effectively wild even at his best, started being much wilder and much less effective. As if some sort of magic spell had been cast on him between innings, suddenly, Ankiel literally couldn't throw the ball over the plate. In that one half inning alone, he threw five wild pitches and gave up four runs, nearly surrendering the entire lead his lineup had given him all in one go. But more than that, it was pretty clear that by the time Tony La Russa pulled him out of the game, Ankiel was pretty shaken up. He joked it off after the game, but the next time he went out, it was the same thing. Facing just 10 batters across two games in their series against the Mets, Ankiel walked half of them and threw four more wild pitches. Both his and the Cardinals' season came to an abrupt and frustrating end, and for Rick Ankiel, the career that had once held so much promise was in serious jeopardy. He tried to come back the next season, but after more control issues and a major elbow injury, his time as a top-level pitcher was pretty much done. There was no medical reason for Rick Ankiel's career to fall apart like that. Physically, he was healthy as a horse, but seemingly out of nowhere, he couldn't do the thing that he was one of the best in the world at doing if his life depended on it. I'm talking about it like what happened to him is still some sort of mystery, but in reality, we know exactly what happened to him. But that may or may not make it any less confusing. Rick Ankiel suffered one of the most prominent cases in recent memory of what's known as the yips, which in sports psychology terms is pretty much the white whale. It's the thing that we in this field have hunted for years and are still searching for answers on, but at the same time, it's also the thing that basically every athlete out there fears being hunted by. In locker rooms all over the country, it's known as things like the curse or the monster, and any person experiencing them will probably be treated like they're carrying some sort of communicable disease. Maybe more so than if they actually were carrying a communicable disease. But understanding the yips takes time and patience, which we're going to need both of to get all the way through this episode. Buckle up, because this one's going to take a while. Asking what the yips are is sort of like asking why the sky is blue. It seems like a pretty straightforward question, but as soon as you try to get into it, you realize how complicated it actually is. The yips are a psychological condition, but not one that can be diagnosed. They have physical manifestations, but more often than not, they have mental and emotional roots. It almost sounds like I'm reading a riddle trying to describe them, but honestly, that's kind of appropriate for a condition like this. People spend their entire professional lives trying to understand what causes the yips and how to treat them, but those people actually know what they're doing, and a lot of times, they still don't get it. And this people certainly doesn't. I don't have time to write literature reviews or recruit study participants or do any of the stuff that real psychologists do. But I do know how to work Google and have a functioning email address, which is how I found Dr. Mark Brana, a mental health counselor who recently finished his PhD in psychology and did his entire dissertation on the yips in baseball. And far be it for me to judge someone for having some pretty esoteric interest in sports, but I did feel compelled to ask him why he chose that particular topic. In my doctoral program, one of the suggestions that came when they were when it was time to study to figure out what you were going to study is, you know, find something you're interested in. And I like baseball. I think you know that comes probably from my grandfather. He always had stories of you know watching the Brooklyn Dodgers play, um, watching the Yankees play in the day. Although he hated the Yankees, um, I grew up in Minnesota. On top of that, and when I was growing up, Chuck Knobloch was a part of the Twins before he went to the Yankees, and his case of the Yips is probably one of the more famous ones as well, um, because it you know basically put an end to his career, and so that that's how I chose my topic. You know, it was more of interest in in things, and that's what I ran with. And run with it, he did. Mark's dissertation is well over two hundred pages long, and while I'd love to say I read the whole thing. <laughs> 
I did not. But just seeing the table of contents gave me some confidence that if ever there was an opportunity to find a concrete and workable definition for what the yips are, it would be now. What I wanted to ask you first is I have yet to get a clear answer on this. Um, but if you could explain this to me like I'm five, um, mm -hmm. what are the yips? So the yips are what you would what you would classify as a task specific focal dystonia, which they're a sudden loss of motor control. It's typically defined motor movements that are affected by this. Um, they're a dystonia because there's no medical reason for them to occur, but yet they're disrupting the nervous system in a manner that's pre preventing the athlete in this case from performing specific moves. In practice, the yips present as involuntary muscle contractions that disrupt a player's ability to coordinate their movements. And these aren't just any old movements being messed with either. The yips usually disrupt movement patterns that have been particularly well trained, like a pitcher throwing the ball over the plate, or like Mark mentioned, a second baseman like Chuck Knobloch throwing the ball to first. It can also present as a kind of tick or involuntary regulatory movement like it did with former Mets catcher Mackie Sasser, who had to rock back and forth or tap his mitt with the ball to be able to throw the ball back to the mound. These are movements that the athletes have done thousands of times, to the point that under normal circumstances, they could do them without even having to think about it. But what if they did start thinking about it? Well, then we'd start having some problems. They cause twitches, jerks, um, just minor incoordination things that disrupt the ability to make the movement accurately. So in baseball, when you are looking at that, it's usually affecting the throws, although there are people that when they're batting as well, there's some yips involved that it, it, it affects their ability to hit the ball. Um, but it's mostly seen in throwing and probably it's more recognized in throwing because it affects the, the trajectory and the flight pattern of the ball. Think about what it means to throw a baseball accurately. Especially if you're throwing as hard as someone like Rick and Keel, you have to have really precise timing to get it to go where you want. And if all of a sudden, in a moment of significant stress, your muscles start contracting when you don't want them to, you can lose that ability completely. And I think it's important to remember that in Rick Ankiel's case, we're talking about an extremely young person in about as high pressure a situation as you can experience in that sport. Rick Ankiel had just turned 21 when that series against the Braves started and was going up against a lineup with three All-Stars and the reigning Rookie of the Year in it as well as facing off against Greg Maddox, a 34-year-old who'd already made eight All-Star teams and won four Cy Youngs. That is a lot to handle for someone who's barely old enough to drink legally. And from that perspective, it's pretty easy to imagine a scenario where that was too much for him to deal with. But here's where we get to an interesting crossroads with the yips. The things we see with the condition are very much physical. I mean, there's a reason we know that Rick Ankiel had them. You can watch a video of him throwing a pitch a foot over the catcher's head and then barely reaching the batter's box with the next one. The yips are unquestionably a neuromuscular problem, but there's also a pretty strong connection between their onset and things like past trauma or extreme stress. Very basically, the yips are a form of performance anxiety, which is very much a psychological condition. They're mental, but they're also physical. And that can make understanding them and figuring out how to treat them pretty complicated. There, there's kind of this divergent understanding of what the origin of the yips can be and then also how they manifest at the time, because there's the physical aspect of it. Like I heard about like thoracic outlet syndrome, mm -hmm. like you actually have this, some type of neuromuscular disruption, or you also have this sort of performance anxiety element that, that sort of vicious cycle type manifestation of the psychological mm -hmm. side of things, where if you get, you know, anxious to the point that you start thinking too much, start ruminating on like that inability to perform the task, like it just gets worse. So in your research, uh, where would you land on that? Is it kind of a both and kind of deal or like a 60, 40? What do you think? So it, it, it's hard to gauge. Um, it's kind of a chicken or egg argument, which, you know, which came first, because with the people that, that I interviewed and that I, you know, studied and everything only to remember exactly where it started. Okay. They don't, though, remember which came first, the thoughts or the disruption. They just remember the moment where things did not go the way they were supposed to. 
So even for the people experiencing them, there seems to be a pretty strong understanding of when the yips came about, but less so of how. And this tracks with someone like Rick and Keel. He remembers the exact at bat where he felt like he started to lose control. Athletes experiencing the yips can remember the moment where things started to break down, but understanding their etiology, or the underlying causes of a condition, is a lot harder. Codifying what's going on with the yips is not easy for anybody, but through a lot of research, people like Mark have helped create a system for classifying them, even if it isn't necessarily perfect. So they actually break the yips down into three specific categories, where one is based more on the neuromuscular aspect, type two is more the psychological aspect, and type three is more of a combination of the, of the two. And so where I said it was interesting, because that was one of the questions I wanted to figure out, you know, is this stemming from a psychological point, or is this stemming more from, okay, we have the physical experience, and then the psychological component comes in, and I never got a good answer with that. And for both Mark's and our purposes, not being able to come up with anything conclusive on that is inherently unsatisfying. Strictly speaking, that's kind of the whole point of research, and when it comes back without any definitive answers one way or the other, that can be pretty frustrating. But when the research doesn't tell you exactly what you want to know, either because it's an impossible question to answer, or in this case, because there just hasn't been enough done on it yet, there's really only one thing you can turn to to try and understand what's going on. So if you've watched my other videos, you know that I love case studies and that I'm an absolutely huge Atlanta Braves fan. Like, it pains me a little to even bring up that division series in 2000 because I know that even with Rick and Keel falling apart right in front of everyone, the Braves still lost that game and ended up getting swept by the Cardinals. And even saying that now, 22 years after the fact, makes me want to throw up a little. But much more recently, the Braves had a playoff series where they did not get swept that also featured a pitcher who'd struggled with the yips. You wouldn't have been able to tell from the way he went after the Dodgers, but the yips almost ended Tyler Matzik's career. The Rockies picked him 11th overall in 2009 and saw him as a guy who could potentially anchor their rotation for years to come. But almost as soon as he reached that status, the fear of losing it put Matzik's entire future in baseball in danger. What started at first as a pretty run-of-the-mill rolled ankle quickly turned into something a lot more serious. Matzik, who by his own admission has struggled with anxiety his entire life, feared what other problems that rolled ankle could lead to. He just finished his rookie year with the Rockies, and it looked okay, if not spectacular, but he'd also put tremendous pressure on himself to become the player that the Rockies thought he was. And just like that, right at the beginning of spring training, a rolled ankle triggered a kind of chain reaction that ended in a full-blown case of the yips. For the first time in his baseball life, Matzik was afraid to throw, and in his mind, there were three potential responses to that fear. Fight, flight, or freeze. And Tyler Matzik, just like all the other athletes who've struggled with the yips over the years, froze. In an article The Ringer did on his battle with the yips, which is super thorough and great and I'll link it in the description, Matzik said it felt like a hitch in his throat that he couldn't control. And if you're trying to do something really difficult that requires really precise timing, like pitching a baseball, that is obviously not ideal. Pretty much as soon as the 2015 season started, it was clear that Matzik was not the same guy he was before. His ERA wasn't horrible, and he actually had a winning record with the Rockies before they sent him to AAA, but take one look at his walks per nine numbers, both in the majors and the minors, and you start to see the problem. Like Rick Ankiel before him, Tyler Matzik could not throw the ball over the plate, and that very nearly ended his career. He never made it back to the majors with the Rockies, and had he not stayed friends with former teammate Michael McHenry, who introduced him to the performance coach that got him back on his feet, there's a good chance that that would have been it. It was only when he started doing throwing sessions in an empty stadium, many of which were with McHenry, that he could really contextualize the true nature of what had happened to him, and why. But as Dr. Brana alluded to, this isn't just a thing that happens to pitchers, or even just to baseball players. For every Tyler Matzik or Rick Ankeel, there's a Chuck Knobloch, or a Steve Sachs not being able to throw the ball from second to first, or even a Markel Fultz or Simone Biles, who aren't baseball players at all. Fultz's struggles with his shooting motion have squashed a lot of the potential that made him the number one overall pick in 2017. And between the yips and a serious ACL injury, there's a lot of doubt over whether or not he'll ever be the player we thought he might be. You might remember Simone Biles withdrawing from the Olympic all-around because of something called the twisties, but that's basically just the gymnast version of the yips. Some combination of the stress and pressure of competing in her second Olympics, as well as there not being crowds at the Tokyo Games, meant that Biles couldn't orient herself in space. 
and pretty understandably, she didn't feel comfortable performing extremely dangerous vaults and tumbling passes without that. There was a disconnect between her mind and body, and in the end, it cost her a chance to do what she loves most. This kind of thing is one of the most common threads you hear with cases of the yips. Tyler Matzik had been conditioned early on to suppress positive emotions to try and avoid seeming like he was bragging about his athletic ability, which he obviously has a lot of. But he didn't receive the same instruction about negative emotions, which meant that when the yips really started to hit him hard, he didn't have the right weapons to fight back. For a professional athlete, their craft makes up a huge proportion of their identity. And when it starts to elude them, especially because of something they can't see or heal, that can be absolutely devastating. The players, they know what the you know, you know, they know what the issue is and the thoughts and the translation of the thoughts into the physical action, there's still a disruption. there. Um, you know, some of the thought processes that were reported were, you know, simply just telling themselves to try and make this throw or don't, don't mess this throw up or don't throw over their head. And then what would happen is exactly what they didn't want to happen. And the more it happened, the worse the thought process has got. And that lack of ability to perform just continues to feed that negative emotion, which just causes more negative performance. And the cycle just keeps going on and on, unless you try to do something about it. But hopefully by now, we've established that this whole yips thing can be pretty tricky. So what, pray tell, might that something actually be? Let me start by saying that I do not have the answer to this. I just gave you a bunch of examples of people having the yips, and I'm pretty sure they all use different approaches to try and get rid of them. Tyler Matzik trained with the Navy SEAL. For Simone Biles, it just kind of took some time in getting more balance in her life. Rikin Keel reinvented himself as an outfielder, which is honestly a pretty awesome story and really deserves an entire episode all on its own. But I mention all of that to say that just like there is no one way for the yips to start, there's no one correct way to treat them either. I do have some ideas, though. That starts with talking about what not to do. Especially in baseball, there is a tremendous amount of stigma around people dealing with the yips and really dealing with mental health issues in general. Calling the yips a curse sounds like just a joke, and for the most part it is but that's kind of exactly how teammates tend to react to it. A player going through the yips is treated like a pariah, someone who you don't want to associate with unless you want to catch whatever it is they've got. I mean, there's even that bit in Ted Lasso where Coach Beard won't actually say the yips out loud. And that attitude towards it creates a culture of shame and silence, to the point that players like Tyler Matzik will do pretty much anything they can to keep what they're going through to themselves. And that's exactly what Mark found in his research, too an environment where players and coaches were conditioned against even acknowledging the problem, much less addressing it. And not coincidentally, that's exactly where Mark would start trying to find a solution. It would be better to get away from the old school coaching strategies um, that were used that either they were punished by being removed or they were punished by being made to work harder. And nobody ever actually talked about it. A lot of the players that were, you know, that played college ball that were experiencing that they could hear their teammates talking behind their backs. And, you know, what more than one of them had said, you know, everybody knew what was going on, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Mark found that pretty much everyone around the teams he studied, including the players going through the yips, was extremely reluctant to discuss it. And when they did acknowledge it, it was in maybe the least helpful way possible this old school, you know, mentality of run it off, stopping a pussy, walk it off, you know, this, this, this. One player said, you know, I would get mother up and down when it was going on and it would make it worse. And none of the trainers would intercede. No, nobody would intercede, but everybody in baseball knows what the yips are. To me, the idea of knowing that one of your teammates is struggling with something and responding by either ignoring them or even worse, being mean to them is kind of insane. You're all in the same team and at least ostensibly have the same goals. So what's the deal? It all goes back to that instinct of keeping the problem under wraps. There is an incredibly strong desire in that kind of environment to tamp down any sort of perceived weakness or vulnerability because it's seen as a threat. Just like the yips themselves are a fight or flight response to intense stress, the reaction to them is too. You can't have some boogeyman around causing problems when you're trying to win games. And as Mark told me, that fear is especially strong in baseball. People that aren't like haven't played baseball or don't understand baseball don't realize how superstitious a lot of these guys are. 
And when it comes to the yips and when it comes to baseball, people don't talk about the yips very often. Those that have had it may know they have it. Their team is likely where they had it, but nobody will actually talk about it. And that presented a bit of a challenge for Mark as a researcher. Because if no one wants to talk about the yips, you're going to have a super hard time finding people to fill up all those dissertation pages, which he did. I threw lines in the water wherever I could. My content expert was able to direct me towards some baseball players that had either, one, had previously studied the yips and um, had helped me kind of track down some places that I could start looking for participants. Um, But there was no direct route to it. Um, There were participants that wanted to do it, but then they got cold feet. And again, it's that whole talking about it. So it, it was it was a challenge to find people. Mark reached out to a couple of his friends who were former pros, but even they didn't want to talk to him about it. It should not be this hard to find 10 people to talk about something, but that is the power of fear in situations like this. Baseball players and athletes all over the sports landscape fear the yips, and if that's where your head's at, then it's game over. Like some of the players that said, you know, it's a curse. Yeah. And so with with that, you know, nobody, you don't want to talk about it if it's a curse. But ironically, talking about the yips may be the best way to rob them of their power. Even after struggling with him for nearly three full years, that's one of the ways that Tyler Matzik dug his way out of the yips hole, which he explained in the most adorable and relatable way imaginable. I don't know the full answer to trying to solve the yips for good, but if it were up to me, the first place I would start would be having a more open dialogue about them. Counseling and support from teammates helped Rick Ankiel and Tyler Matzik get back to where they could play baseball for a living again. And even though he only had 10 participants, Mark's study showed similar results. Two of the participants within the study had identified that when they were able to actually openly talk about it or had somebody that was more supportive, they subsided much quicker than if um, they had not. There could be any number of ways to get an individual case of the yips to go away. Meditation, mechanical change, hypnosis, recreational drugs, whatever floats your boat. All of those could be effective in their own way because everybody is different and it stands to reason that their bodies and brains would respond to different things. But so much of the conversation around the yips is rooted in culture. Culture of wanting to seem tough, culture of wanting to be seen as a winner, of playing through injuries because that's what good ballplayers do. Or good swimmers or cyclists or whatever else because again, this isn't just a baseball thing. But changing the culture that so often makes the yips worse starts with talking about them more openly and accepting them as a normal condition that lots of people get. If you treat it like it's this big, scary thing, there's every chance that it can become one. So don't. Just treat it like Voldemort, because again, this may be my favorite thing I've ever read. This journey through the history and ideology of the Ips has been a long one, but for my money, it's totally worth it. And there are a lot of reasons for that not least of which is that the yips are way more common than you might realize. An article from Scientific American pointed out that nearly half of all serious golfers experience them at one point or another, and I can't imagine that the numbers for baseball or other sports are that far off. Hopefully the fact that the yips are so ubiquitous can help take some of the stigma away from them, because it absolutely should. There's so much misunderstanding about what dealing with the yips actually means, especially when it comes to how it reflects on an athlete's mental toughness. One of my favorite quotes from that article came from Tyler Matzik's performance coach, who, in addition to being a former pitcher, was also a freaking Navy SEAL. And even he had trouble with the yips. I would argue that there is little to no correlation between having the yips and whether or not someone is mentally tough. And we should stop acting like there ever was. It's a normal thing that normal people deal with. And if we start treating it as such, I think we can get a lot of athletes some much needed relief. In any case, I hope you learned something about the yips from what's turned into an incredibly gratuitous and self-indulgent episode. Probably didn't have to take half an hour to explain all of it, but in that time, we've gone over what the yips are, worked through a few examples of them out in the wild, and finally, we've talked about what we can do to try and treat them. And most importantly of all, we've established that if you know someone who's experiencing the yips, the best thing you can do for them might be just to talk to them about it. It may seem unlikely, but that could be the difference between them developing into the player they've always wanted to be and quitting the game forever. The yips are part of sports, and in a certain sense, they're kind of inevitable. Someone out there at some point is going to get them. But that doesn't mean they have to be final. And like a World Series championship that at one time would have seemed impossible, 
for a home run that no one ever thought would happen. That is something worth celebrating. Hello to everyone out there still watching. If you made it to this point in the video, you are a true friend of the channel, and for that I am incredibly grateful. If you enjoyed the content, which I sure hope you did because there was an awful lot of it, be sure to give the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more stuff like it. Shorter stuff, though. Can't imagine we're going to do any videos this long anytime soon. Unless you like longer episodes like this, which you should absolutely let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like to see. In any case, the yips are an incredibly important topic in sports psychology, and I wanted to make sure they got the love they deserved. Won't be the last time we talk about them either, but mercifully, that is all for today. Till next time, I'm Will. Thanks for watching.